Hey, Connie. Um, sorry for the delay in getting this video to you, um, but I finally am able to get around to it. So give me one second. This video, I'll try and make it as quick as possible, is going to explain um, graphical convolution, but specifically the case when we have a non-symmetric uh, well, I'll just say a non-symmetric function. Um, but specifically, this is when the, the second function is non-symmetric. So if we have, let's say, G1 in the time domain convolved with G2 in the time domain, this is when G2 is non-symmetric. So just to um, do an example problem, uh, we'll say that G1 is a rect function that looks like this. Uh, G1 of t equals, let's say, 2 rect of t. So what's that going to look like? That is going to just look like this. We're in the time domain. And we know that the rect function goes from negative one half to positive one half. I'll make G1 red. And oh, let me label the y axis. It's going to have an amplitude of two. Let's label that as two. And that comes from this two right here. So here we go. This is what our function looks like. Great, that's G1. And then let's say that G2 of t equals rect of t minus 1. So what's that going to look like? That is going to, I'm actually going to this over. That's going to look like this. We're still in the time domain for this function. But uh, if we were to use the landmark technique, what we would end up with is, let's just label the axis, the three halves, and then this one's only going to have an amplitude of one, so I'll drop down there. Okay, what we would end up with, uh, we could use the landmark technique to verify this, but we would end up with this function right here. It looks like a normal rect, except for um, it is shifted to the right by one. And that's this minus one right here. But like I said, you can always use the landmark technique to check that. And actually, I'm just going to rescale this so it looks a little more normal. So we want this one to look like it's tall and skinny because it has an amplitude of two. And we actually want this one to just look like our normal proportions. Oops. Because it is scaled the way that we're used to. So it's one. Okay, great. So hopefully up to this point, that was pretty straightforward. I just defined a G1 function right here, G2 function right here. And we're convolving G1 with G2. We want to find out what this is equal to. And G2 is a non-symmetric function. And it's the second function in our convolution because we're saying that this is the first function and this is the second function. And when I say non-symmetric, all I mean is that if we flipped this function over the y-axis, it would not look the same. Okay, so... Uh, what's our first step after we draw the functions in the time domain? Well, it's to redraw them in the tau domain. So um, if we redraw G1 in the tau domain, that one's always easy because it's our very first function. This one always looks the exact same, but we just replace T with tau. So great, we just drew G1 of tau, which just equals two rects of tau, just like that. But now, if we want to draw G2 in the tau space, this is going to be G2 
of t minus tau, because if you remember in convolution, the second function, we always replace the t with t minus tau. So what this is going to look like is rect of, where we had a t, we need a t minus tau, minus one, great. I just put in, oops, I just put in t minus tau for that t right there. Hopefully you can see that. And what this is going to look like is, if you remember, what we had done last time was we just drew our function at some sort of arbitrary location up here to the right. Yeah, something like that. And we said that this center point was t, right? And then we knew that the width of this was 1. So we said this was t plus a half, and this was t minus a half. That's what we went over on the board when we did it together in person. But the minor correction that I need to make is that we need to account for the fact that when we first mirror this function about the y-axis, we're going to end up with a mirrored function that's over here, right? Because if we take this blue thing and we mirror over the vertical axis, this is what we'd get. And the point where the center of this function would be at would be negative one, because originally it was at positive one. Okay. So then when we shift it to the right by t, like we do for convolutions, the distance it has moved is actually going to be, we have negative one right here. And when we come all the way over here, <clears throat> we've shifted by a distance of t. That's this whole length. Therefore, the coordinates of the center, or in other words, the coordinates, oops, that doesn't look good. Again. The coordinates in terms of tau is actually going to be t minus one. The reason is because I'm just going to redraw the arrow that we have above, which is this arrow. But now we can see that this portion, this one right here, has a distance of one, and the portion right here has a distance of t minus one. Because if we add this portion and this portion, then we get t, which is the overall shift. Okay, one plus t minus one equals, we cancel these ones, we get t. So I'm essentially just showing why we now need to label the center of this function as t minus one instead of t. And it's because when we flipped this function or mirrored it about the vertical axis, it put us over on the left a distance of one. So then when we move to the right, whatever coordinate we are on the right-hand side of our vertical axis when we're over here is going to be t minus one. Okay, so that means this is going to be t minus one plus a half because we still have a full width of one, meaning that half of the width is one half. So t minus one plus one half, we could just rewrite that as t minus one half. Okay, and then over here on the left side, we have t minus one minus a half, or we could just rewrite that as t minus three halves. Great. And then we can do what we're used to, which is finding out the when the overlap happens and when the overlap doesn't happen. So we could say there is overlap for, um, let's see, we want to line up the right edge of this function with the left edge of that function. 
And what do we get? We get uh, t minus one half that came from here equals negative one half that comes from here. And so if we add one half to both sides, we get t equals zero. Okay. Now we do the same thing where we're going to line up this left edge with this right edge. So what do we get? We get t minus three halves from there. t minus three halves is equal to one half that comes from there. Okay, if we add three halves to both sides, we're gonna end up with t equals two. Is that right? Let me check three halves. Uh yeah, that should be good. Okay. Okay. And then we would say um essentially then if we want to draw the convolution of our two functions, uh once again, this is always going to look like either a triangle or a trapezoid, right? And if the two functions have the same width, which they do have the same width, we're going to get a triangle. And if they have differing widths, or, or yeah, if they had differing widths, we would get trapezoid. But one way we can check that is just say, that the maximum overlap is going to occur at, let me move this down to a little more space. The maximum overlap is going to occur when these two are sitting on top of each other. As you're citing this, you'll see that right here, we start to get some overlap, it goes to a maximum, and then it starts to decrease. And then once again, we have no overlap. So, when the maximum overlap occurs, our two left edges are lined up and our two right edges are lined up. So now if we just line up left edge with left edge and solve, we're going to get t minus three halves is equal to negative one half. So let's do that. t minus three halves is equal to negative one half. If we add three halves to both sides, we're going to get t equals one. Okay, we could do the same thing if we wanted to with the right edges. We'll get the same answer, but let's just do it. We'd have t minus one half equals one half. Let me fix this. Maybe something looks kind of weird. Okay, so we get t minus one half equals one half. So if we add one half to both sides, we get t equals one. Um, consistent result with both cases. So when we come over to draw our function, let's label this one, label this two, cut three, zero. Um, we know that there's going to be no overlap when t is less than zero and no overlap when t is greater than two. So let's throw those points on there. This is where overlap starts to occur. And then we know that our maximum overlap occurs when t equals one. So let's go t equals one. There's our maximum overlap. And we can draw a function. I'll make this one green. The involved function is going to look like that. And the last thing we need to do is find out what is the maximum overlap of these functions. The way we can think about this is and I'm actually going to just erase this now so that that's not confusing. Okay, the way we can think about this is when they are overlapping and sitting on each other, we're going to get an amplitude of one and an amplitude of two. So we multiply two times one, we get two. Okay, and then, so if I'm drawing the picture of the maximum overlap, Right here, we get a height of two. I'm just gonna draw it like this. Height of two and the width. Well, both of our functions have a width of one. So when they're overlapping each other, there's 
a width of one overlap. So one right here, one times two, we want to find the area of this rectangle is two. Area equals one times two, which equals two. So when we're at a maximum overlap, we hit a value of two. This right here is our final answer. That is G1 convolved with G2. And it's the exact same as what we were doing before. Just the one difference was that if our second function, G2, was non-symmetric, we need to think about where is the center of this function going to end up when we mirror it about the vertical axis. And then we need to subtract whatever points, um, or in other words, add, sorry, because this is negative one, we're adding negative one. So we need to account for the point that we end up with at when we mirror it. So hopefully that's not too confusing. I tried to keep it short and uh, straightforward, but here you go. Here's the final answer. Feel free to study this video, uh, apply it in the homework whenever your second function is non-symmetric and we can go over it together uh, next time we have a tutoring session. Thanks.